This is Sarah Watson, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. My name is Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, episode 93 for April 6th, 2020. Well, this is actually a landmark episode for me. Uh, you may wonder why, well, 93 episodes doesn't really sound like an impressive number, but between my Chuck podcasts and the TV Writer Podcast, this is my 200th episode. And to celebrate this grand 200th episode, I can't think of a better person than Sarah Watson, the creator of The Bold Type and author of the newly released YA novel, Most Likely. We had a lot of fun with our interview. Not surprising. She is a wonderful person. I first met her a few months ago at a convention. She actually, based on meeting her at that convention, she offered to get together for coffee with me and my daughter to tell my daughter all about what it was like to, to write in television. Just a very gracious person, lots of fun. You're gonna love the interview. Before we get to that, I do wanna tell you that this episode is sponsored by Pilar Alessandra of onthepage.tv. And I had mentioned last week that there was a class that she was um, sponsoring that started April 4th. And I did get, get a confirmation from Pilar that you can still take part of, in that class if you haven't already, it's an online class. And all you have to do is um, you can play the recording of the first class, and then you can join in on following classes with everybody else. It takes place on Saturdays, so that means if you're hearing this on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you still have time to, to uh, take part of this class. You can use the 10% off code on the page 10 at checkout. The class is writing the first draft, and the cool thing about this class is that you basically go from idea to a finished pilot in, in this six week period. And Pilar really specializes in helping you to write to a schedule. If you want to take advantage of your time that you're staying at home because of the virus, I highly, highly, highly recommend uh, checking out this class. It's an interactive online class through Zoom and you can, you can literally come to the end of it with a, with a pilot script. Please go to the website at tvwriterpodcast.com for all of the different ways you can access this podcast. There's a video feed, there's an audio feed, you can get it at Podbean, at Spotify, you can go on YouTube, you can, you can go a whole bunch of different places to get this, and uh, you can get it on iTunes, of course, in audio-only version now, or video. It's going to be released every Monday for the next couple of months because we're on quarantine, and I want to give you lots of stuff to listen to. So anyway, on to the interview with Sarah Watson. You're going to love it. Enjoy. Well, I'm here with Sarah Watson. Um, we've met before, but it's so great to have you on the podcast. Um, creator of The Bold Type, showrunner of the upcoming untitled film reenactment project, <laughs> which we'll hear about, and author of the newly released YA novel, Most Likely. How are you doing? I'm in quarantine like everyone else. I'm hanging in there. Thanks yeah. so much for having me on. Cool. You're welcome. And thanks for taking time on your birthday. Yes, it is my birthday in quarantine. Yeah. I was supposed to be on set shooting my pilot, and instead I'm locked in the house. <laughs> uh, happy birthday. Um, Thank you. And, uh, well, actually, let's let's talk about that. It, it is sort of the elephant in the room for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I know that you've had some personal connection to this virus. Um, how personally and professionally is this virus affecting you? Oh, hugely. Um I was, you know, my first, this is my first network pilot to be picked up, which is a huge career milestone. I was in Atlanta prepping for it. We were, it was the Friday before we were supposed to start shooting the following Tuesday when we had to make the decision to pull the plug for now. Um, and, and my book also came out that week. So not only do I have a canceled pilot, I have a canceled book and also had to just make sure that, you know, all the actors and all the department heads who were in from out of state got home safely. And it's just been a tremendous load. And then, um, I flew back the, let's see, we, we had the table read on Friday, made the decision to shut down that afternoon, told everyone that evening, People started flying home that night. I flew home the next night. I wanted to sort of make sure everyone else got home first. Um, and then I found out when I got back that two of my friends here in Los Angeles are positive for COVID-19. Wow. It's, wow. yes, it's just been wild. And yeah. um, they're doing really well now. They, mm -hmm. um, 
fortunately it was never bad enough that they had to go into the hospital, Mm. but it's been, it's been tough and they have a toddler and it's just starting to feel closer and closer. Mm Mm-hmm. Very much so, and and it seems like every day we learn more Ugh. about this, and and what we learn is, and I'm and I'm not talking about panic or anything like that, but there's very real stuff because because the information that we got in the beginning was that it was only people who had symptoms. That yeah. It. Then all of a sudden we get the fact that it's contagious before, um, like in the incubation period. And now I'm starting to hear so much about the aerosol, like like the oh, I know the, it being in the air and shared spaces and things like that. So, yeah. Well, it's also it was so strange because I feel like I was in such a bubble because, like I said, we were shooting in Atlanta, and when I when we made the decision sh- to shut down, I think there was still only one case in the entire state of Georgia, or maybe it was still zero. And so while I was there, it never felt imminent. Um, and also I had so little time to be online and to be looking at the news because I was in the middle of both launching a book and doing a pilot. I, you know, the night before our table read, I think I was up till three in the morning doing changes on the script. And so I was barely looking at the news and the vibe in Atlanta was not like LA and New York where there were cases popping up. It was still very much business as usual. I went out to dinner with people the night before we made the decision to shut down. And so It just, it feels like it all happened so fast. And I was in this kind of bubble of not really knowing how serious it was. Mm -hmm. And it just moved so quickly that it was almost shocking when I came back to LA to realize, oh my gosh, this is so much bigger than I had, had realized. Mm. Yeah. And, and in your situation, and I, and I know I go, because I was watching, um, you're talking about your launch, (laughs) it was coming up, you're talking about this pilot. I was so excited to see what was going to happen. And then both of those things just yanked. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, and I know there's a lot of, uh, I'm hearing that a lot of TV staffs are starting up virtual rooms and, and things yeah. like that. But how do you do a virtual pilot? <laughs> yes, you can't really do a virtual pilot. So what the network has done is they've ordered a backup script. So I'm writing mm-hmm. episode number two right now or trying when I can mm-hmm. when I can focus and working on a series format. So I'm really happy and grateful that I have deadlines right now and things that keep to keep mm-hmm. me busy because I am it was it was also a very hard adrenaline shift to mm-hmm. go from pilot pre-production mode where you're working 24/7 and just really working towards this huge huge thing and we did it. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a really truncated prep time. We had less than a month because um because of the movie rights issue with Goonies, um, it had been a rights issue up until the last minute to get all that locked into place. And so we were a very late pickup, but we it all came together at the last minute. We got this amazing cast, mm. we got all our locations. It's just like, we did it. And then it was like, nope, you don't get to shoot on Monday. And so I was also so burned out, so exhausted. So it was a really weird thing to wake up on that on that Tuesday morning that we were supposed to start shooting. Mm. It was just, it was a very weird, weird feeling. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll start to um, see life returning sometime soon. Yes. Um, Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a weird, it's a very weird time because in some ways um, the numbers are very inflated. Like you see the numbers going way, way up, but a lot of it is just because now we're finally testing people. Mm -hmm. And so it's good. But at the same time, it's still scary that they're going, they're going up. Oh yeah, it's. I mean, it's super scary. It's yeah, yeah it's uh, it's wild out there. So yeah. I'm just staying hunkered down and writing yeah. indoors in my own home. And I'm a total coffee shop writer, so mm-hmm. this has been. <laughs> and my boyfriend's home, and he's uh-huh. a teacher, so he's doing a lot of Zoom yeah. things with his students. So like, sort of figuring out where in the house we can each be. Yeah. It's been it's been interesting. There's there's one director I know who's been posting every day about how he's he's really um, going all out with this homeschooling his his kids. Oh no! Um, <laughs> and he like. He d- had dresses up with a new theme every day, and um, oh like my one, gosh. one day he's the janitor and he's sweeping behind them, and one day he's something else. Um, it's let's see I, how I, long. Let's see quarantine day forty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's let's shift gears from okay. that. Um, and uh, what I do want to talk to you about. Um, and first of all, I want to rewind a little bit. Thank you so much for. Um, I mean, we just met a few months ago. 
and and agreeing to sit down for coffee with with my daughter and it was it was a really oh, wonderful so time. Fun. Um, she's actually uh, she's taking a uh, class with Pilar Alessandra now and like online and she's amazing just going all out for this. Um, but one of the things you you talked to us about was this really cool program at UCLA. Yeah, um, you've been teaching at LA at UCLA not this year, but but you have been. But last please, year, yeah. yeah. Please tell me about this. Um, talk about this on on camera here. Yeah, so I I got the opportunity to teach this incredible class, and it's been really neat to see the way UCLA, the Department of Theater, Film, and Television, has really shifted their curriculum to be a lot more practically focused. They hire a lot of working TV and feature writers, which is such a smart thing to do because obviously the industry is moving so fast and there are so many changes that people who haven't been in the field for 15 years aren't going to know kind of what's going on and what's happening these days. Mm. So last, I almost said last season, last (laughs) year, um, I taught in the spring quarter, I taught this amazing class um, where I ran a simulated TV writer's room. Very cool. Super cool. And it was mm-hmm. such great practical experience. The students were amazing. So I had nine students in the class. I used a friend's pilot, a friend's dead pilot that uh, mm-hmm. that never went. And we basically broke a season of that. And I, I set it up exactly like a writer's room. I cast the show, printed out headshots of, mm-hmm. of who our cast would be, brought in note cards. Um, we note carded, the you know, figured out loose arcs for the whole season. I had them pitch back stories. I had them um, group writing episodes. And it was really great because one of, I think, the hardest things in TV is to get comfortable pitching on the fly. Some people are amazing at it. Some people, it's easy. Um, but what I what I told all my students is it's one thing to be te- to doing that in a classroom with a group of your peers. Mm-hmm. It's another when you go into a writer's room and there are huge people with huge credits and huge egos and suddenly the nerves kick in. And so I think it's important to have kind of that safe place of the of the classroom where everyone can get really comfortable pitching, figure out how to pitch on topic, how to, you know, how to really make the most out of being in a room mm. because you only get one first chance yeah. and you want to go in as prepared and and ready as possible. Very, very cool. I, I maybe, and somebody who watches this can tell me if there's another one. I haven't heard of another um, situation like that for students where they can actually do a mock writer's room. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think US, mm-hmm. USC is starting to do it. And then I had somebody reach out to me on Twitter because, and I can't remember what university it was now, his, um, uh, where he was an alum from was starting to do something. So he wanted to talk to me about how, how I did it. But it's, I think it's a little harder in the places outside of New York and Los Angeles to be able to have working mm. TV and film writers yeah. teach I, these classes. I won't tell you stories now, but I could tell you stories about um, going to film school in the early 90s in Toronto, and there was just no TV. Like, ask yeah. about TV, it was like crickets. Uh, everybody w- was was talking about film, and, and TV is where most of the work is. <laughs> So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was also a huge switch. I mean, the 90s is really when that exploded. Yeah, yeah TV, we used to be sort of like the bastard stepchild of film. <laughs> and now, <laughs> yeah. oh, how the tides have turned. Oh, yeah. Um, well, let's let's rewind back and talk about sort of how you got started. Um, we, were, we were talking about IMDb and how spotty it can be in terms of, of backgrounds. Tell me sort of, um, and I know you, and just to explain to the viewers, I recorded these out of order. So I did talk to Erica Lisan Mittman yesterday, um, and she told me about Rachel's room. Did, yeah. you, did you actually work with her on that? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, oh my gosh, it was so long ago. This was literally, I think this was 1999, maybe two, maybe it was 2000 or 2001. It was mm-hmm. very early days of internet content. Yeah. And so Erica, um, and I can't even remember the guy's name who she was working on this with, Um, put together this great little, almost like a series of shorts. I mean, she obviously Mm -hmm. listened to her podcast first because I'm sure she described it better. Um, But it was sort of one of the first internet internet format um, storytelling. And I was Mm -hmm. trying to break into into TV, but, you know, there's only a certain number of shows. It's so hard. And so um, they hired a lot of um, writers with assistant credits to do these little pieces for, for the show. And it was just a great opportunity to 
you know, the first time I got to see a real actor saying my line. <laughs> yeah. And I think everybody thought it, whenever this was 2000 or whenever it was that, that, that suddenly TV was going to go away and it was all going to be online. And uh. <laughs> obviously it took a long time to make that switch. Yeah, Very, very long time. And so, so from that, um, tell me a, a little bit of the early days, like how you yeah. first got on staff and, uh, and, and then what led to what in that kind of thing? Sure, sure. Yeah, because I was definitely not a meteor, meteoric overnight rise to success or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, is what, when I was sort of coming up in the business, was just when that was, when that was switching. I think, it, like, 10 years before me, it would be all these Harvard Lampoon guys would get mm -hmm. staffed onto these huge shows right out of college and... When, when I was, was coming up, it really was, was starting to get very hard to get a foot in the door young. They, mm. And so I, I worked on my writing a lot. I wrote a feature that got me an agent, um, and I said I want to do TV. And so they kind of, like, wheeled out the lowest-level TV agent <laughs> <laughs> to be like, all right, well, you know, here's this guy. And yeah. so I wrote a spec spec Gilmore Girls and uh -huh. a spec Six Feet Under, which uh -huh. is so funny that then I ended up working with the two stars of those shows on oh, wow. Parenthood. Yeah. Um, so that was very funny. But so, you know, I did, I would get meetings, but not get shows. And so I just kept working assistant jobs and was able to get a couple freelances. That way I wrote a couple episodes of That's So Raven. Mm. And I really was open to anything. I desperately wanted to be a one hour TV drama writer, you know, shows like Felicity, those were what I really wanted to be doing, but I was willing to take anything. Mm. So I did the That's So Ravens, which was a wonderful experience. Um, and then through that, um, I got to know producers who were doing this show called Beyond the Break, which was a cable show before cable was cool. Mm -hmm. um, and it had a, and that was really great for me because it was a really small writer's room. There were three writers. So even though I was the lowest level writer in the room, I was doing a ton hmm. and I learned, I learned to write fast. I learned to pitch. I learned production. A lot of times when you're that low level, um, you know, if I had been staffed onto a big network show, I would have been like one of 10, hmm. probably not speaking a lot in the room, maybe not even writing an episode, definitely not producing my own episode. Hmm. So in a way kind of coming up on, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to say this without sounding insulting. <laughs> Basic cable, I guess, yeah. it was really advantageous. And then through, and also, I just I would say yes to everything through through that experience. I worked with a producer who's who had money to do low budget disaster movies, so I wrote mm -hmm. two for him. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like yeah. They're... I was wondering. I was going to ask you about these these movies that were sort of in the middle there. Yeah, you're like, what is this? Yeah. I know. Yes. Who's like now known for like character and like heart? And I wrote Disaster Zone Volcano in New York. Oh. <laughs> Aired on Sci Fi Channel. My dad found it in a like a five dollar bin at Walmart in Wisconsin uh -huh. like a year ago and told everybody in the store my daughter wrote this. Oh, wow. And I'm like, Dad, please go back into the store and tell them I have a legitimate career now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, do you get to even the point where, um, I mean, I, I'm almost 300 episodes, and and people will see something, and I forgot I did it. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so 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 from you, you're doing these TV or these these movies, and then and yeah. dancing around a bit. Uh, when when do you feel like your your career really took off? Okay, so when everything changed was getting my first network show. So I um, I got staffed onto this Lifetime miniseries called Monarch Cove, um, where I ended up in Australia, because that's where we shot. So I was there for about, oh gosh, I think five or six months. Hmm. So I had my whole life there. I had an apartment there. And wow. then that show ended, and I, um, I did a phone interview with the showrunner of um, this Fox series called Standoff. Mm -hmm. um, they were looking to add two writers to the show mid season. And, you know, I did this phone call from Australia. There was this total delay on the call. Like we kept talking over each other. I was like, Oh, well that was terrible. I'll never get that job. <laughs> and then the next day I was flying to Bangkok to meet friends to, to, um, have a little vacation time before I came back to Australia. And I landed to all these text messages from my agent saying, where are you? You got the job. You start <laughs> Monday. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I basically turned around, flew back to Australia, packed up my apartment, 
flew back to the United States where I hadn't been in five or six months, went through like five, six months of mail, got my life back Uh in order, and then started this show on the following Monday. I was still totally jet lagged. And it was like eight high level dudes and me in the writer's room. (laughs) And thank God, like I was too exhausted and overwhelmed to be intimidated. (laughs) Uh Wow. Wow. So what what was that experience? Your your first... um... That was your first big network show or was it? Yeah, that was my, yeah, that was my first big network show. And it just, it puts you into a different category. As soon Mm -hmm. as you have that first network credit, it's like suddenly you're legitimate. Cause Mm -hmm. I had all these cable credits, but none of them were particularly sexy credits. And so it's like, you need that one first job to give you legitimacy. And then it was like, everything changed overnight. We knew that show wasn't coming back, but that staffing season, I mean, I had, I think I met on 11 shows or something. I had multiple offers because suddenly I became somebody with legitimate network credits. Hmm. And, and I just find it so interesting. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to shift the focus of the podcast is there is so much, um, focusing on getting that first staff yeah job. and and yet it's like i'm on staff now what it was years until you yeah you hit that point where you won the network show that was really the 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 catalyst um oh, totally. and, yeah. and talk about was there, like talk about that was that a bit of your impression when you was there any thought like, okay, I've got my, my first staff job now, it's going to be easy or? Oh, no, I thought, I mean, every time, I mean, it's a little different now that I'm farther along in my career. But I mean, for the first several years, every job I had, I thought would be my last job. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, but I also I think I'm a little bit of a realist. And I, it's interesting, I do tend to be an optimist. But I just think TV writing is so hard. And the staff's at the, if things are different now because there's so many more shows. I think that's mm. the other reason why I feel a little more relaxed about yeah. the fact that I will continue to work. But um, there was only a set number of network shows back then. And it, if you didn't get one, you were out of work for a year or until mid-season. And so things were just very, very different then. Mm. It, well, and it seems like once your career took off, you weren't in that situation very much. You you pretty much went from show to show. Would that be yeah. correct to... Definitely. And I always had multiple offers. Yeah. It was, uh, it, yeah. Like I said, stand up changed everything. And and that was purely because it was a network show or, or would you say that a lot of, cause I know what, when I was talking with Erica, she was mentioning a lot of um, the relationships that she had built yeah. sort of as she was working her way up. Do you think that helped you or was it more keying off of that network show? I, th- I think for me, it was really keying off of the network show. The relationships definitely helped. And then I got to a point where I had, um, you know, all those high level guys that I was so intimidated of on the first day, I had them willing to vouch for me and make calls Mm. to showrunners, um, and, and give me that stamp of legitimacy. Um, but I also think, I I think a little bit of it is luck. Mm. It was a time when, um, everybody was looking to hire women. Um, Mm. there had been, you know, that we were in, had been, we were coming out of this era of mostly male writing staffs or, you know, I, I've been in three writers rooms in my career where I was the only woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I feel like that it still happens, but it's a lot more rare. Mm-hmm. And so um, it, it was a time when people were actively looking to hire women and I'm a woman. So I do think <laughs> I do think that helped a lot. Mm-hmm. As well, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, and I mean that. I, actually, when I started this podcast in 2010, um, the w, WGA had just put out a report talking about the percentage of women in, in TV writer staffs and it was abysmal at that yeah. time. And yeah. so I I mean I'd I'd be curious to know what it is today. I know it's definitely not where it could be, but but a huge improvement to where it was. Huge improvement. It's getting yeah, it's definitely getting better and better. So ladies come on in. <laughs> Plenty of room. <laughs> good news for my daughter. Yes, very good news. <laughs> yeah. So um so tell tell me about okay, I do have to ask you about the middleman. Um, work oh, with yeah, Javi. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that looked like a really fun show. It's also a very different show from Standoff. So talk about writing for that one. 
That was so fun. That was that was totally a labor of love. And it's interesting because I talked about like how hard I had worked to get out of basic cable. Uh-huh. And then I took this job that put me back into basic cable, but it was purely because I loved, I loved, loved, loved the script. Mm-hmm. I had met Javi. Um, we have sort of like this funny meet cute. Um, when I, so I told you I had signed with this, like this agency on my, on the feature side. And then they mm-hmm. paired me up with this like very low level, um, uh, TV agent. And when I, I, the first spec I wrote for him was a Gilmore girls yeah. and he didn't watch the show, but read it and was like, I think this might be good. And <laughs> Javi was a client agency. And so he knew Javi was a big Gilmore girls fan. And so he said, do you mind, do you mind give, just reading 10 pages of this and yeah. tell me if it's good. And he read the whole thing, uh-huh. flipped out it was like i love this um i want to meet with this girl a hobby was he, he didn't have any jobs for me he was writing and lost at the time but we went yeah. out and had lunch or a drink i think and just stayed in touch and because yeah. Javi and i both have this very like snappy quick writing style we love um which the gilmore girls and very middleman and so he told me about this comic he was doing the middleman and he said at that first lunch or drinks or whatever it was if i ever get this show on the air you're the first person i'm calling oh wow and However many years later, true to his word, he did. And even though it was network, I it wasn't network. I mm-hmm. definitely t- took the call. <laughs> very cool. I, I think I think it's very important to do those fun jobs. Yeah. You have to take one every once in a while because there's a lot of times you say yes, and it's a bit of a long haul. Um, yeah. And you need those too, but you got to have a little fun. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, so tell me about. Uh, there were uh, uh, two or three others, and then Parenthood. Would you? It seems like Parenthood was another sort of um, stepping stone like, for you. Huge. Parenthood definitely changed my career too, because prior to that, I really felt like I was kind of the black widow of network television. <laughs> I kept going on to all these shows that only went thirteen episodes. Yeah. And um, after the, the Middleman, uh, only I think only went twelve. You know. So I had just been going from show to show. I went Lipstick Jungle to The Middleman and then The Middleman to The Unusuals, uh, created by Noah Hawley. I really took that show um, because I wanted to live in New York. (laughs) And the the writer's room was going to be in New York. Um, And that was a lot of fun. And so when that ended and we knew we were getting canceled um, and I was still I was living in New York, sort of figuring out what I was going to do. And my agent and I talked and he said, my goal for this season is to find a home for you somewhere where you can be longer than 13 episodes. And true to his word, I I read all the pilots and the ones I loved the most were flash forward Uh and parenthood. And this is, this is such an example of like, sometimes when things don't work out, they do work out because I really thought I was going to get an early offer on flash forward. I had this great Uh meeting and then I didn't. And yeah. I was so devastated. But yeah. then I got Parenthood. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it, it's interesting when you look back, Parenthood mm-hmm. went for six seasons. Flash Forward went for one, I think. Uh, no, not even. Not I even. don't, yeah, not even yeah, one. It was one, of the, it was one of those big, and, and I think it was after Lost, so many networks yeah. wanted these big event pilots, but then they couldn't, like they were sort of, ev- everything happened in the first episode. And then... Yeah, you know, where does it go? <laughs> yeah, where oh does yeah, it go? the pilot was amazing, <laughs> and yeah. then yeah, just couldn't figure out what to do with it. And whereas Parenthood was this, and I also at the time I was sort of trying to figure out: am I going to go more the genre route, which is hmm. which is what I, I I love to watch that. Um, but I do think that going on to Parenthood, I really really found my voice as a writer and what I'm mm-hmm. good at, which is these character shows, these small moments, and. So I feel like working under Jason Kadams, it taught me to be this very different kind of writer than I had been. And it turned out that was, that was exactly the perfect fit for mm. the kind of stuff I should be doing. I, ha- I had the identical conversation with my daughter yesterday because she loves to watch genre stuff, but she tends to write character stuff. Yeah. 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 Very cool. And I mean, so, a lot yeah. of the genre stuff has amazing character stuff. Sometimes you get those perfect blend shows like Battlestar Galactica, something mm. like that. Yeah. Uh, and so you're finding your voice with Parenthood. As you're finding your voice, was that when you started to develop material or were, it, had you been developing before that? I, I'm i trying to think. I really hadn't been actively developing. And um, part of the reason was because I did very consistently go from show to show. 
And when you're, unless you're high level, um, usually in your contracts, the first season you're on a show, you can't develop, mm. you get a development out in your second season. But yeah. like I said, you've I was never, the black yeah. widow of network television. So I never made it to a second season. So I never had the opportunity to take mm. things out. I had written one spec pilot, but I had never gone through the development process. And then, um, with, um, when I, let's see, was it, I think season four of parenthood was when I signed an overall deal. And as part of the deal, I had to develop. Mm. <laughs> so, nice. um, uh, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was, that was my first development, um, time going through. Cool. So, t- so tell me about your development experience in terms of uh, which projects you worked on, what it was like, and then obviously it led to the one that really hit. Yeah. So, um, you know, m- very mixed development experiences. My first experience was really good. I sold something to Fox, um, this um, legal show, but a very character heavy legal show. Um, it was kind of Bridesmaids meets Ally McBeal. Um, and we, we sold it in a in a competitive situation between Fox, ABC and NBC. So mm. first one out of the gate, it felt really good to sell something in the room. My first time out yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely helped my confidence. It was a good development season, but it ultimately didn't get picked up. And then we ended up, I ended up redeveloping it for ABC the following season. Um, again, positive development experience didn't get picked up. I think what I, what I've started to realize now more and more is that y- they kind of, know which shows they're going to be <laughs> or if you're in serious contention fairly mm-hmm. early in the process mm-hmm. so um you re- you know look there's always exceptions but you kind of need those big auspices those big people involved which brings me to the bold type mm-hmm. that was um i sold that on the final year of my deal with universal and i was it was with Joanna Coles involved and with cosmopolitan magazine involved. And that definitely put me into a different category, having those offices. However, we still didn't get picked up. You did uh, Sold it to NBC, developed it for NBC. It was basic premise, but very different in, um, the show was originally the Alex character was the center of it because mm-hmm. when you're at work, at least at the time you got to skew mail. Oh, wow. it, so interesting to think back now yeah. because this was like way pre B2 and mm-hmm. it was like when Les Moonves we, we would still get notes at CBS like Les hates women please like dial down the women like that was and you'd be like okay I'll do that <laughs> um so yeah I sold it to NBC with a male lead it was kind of a fish out of water story it was mm-hmm. this he was a former Wall Street um not Wall Street uh yeah Wall Street Journal reporter who had lost his job, couldn't get a job anywhere. So the what the job he takes is at a Cosmo type magazine. Wow. So it's really very much a fish out of water story. And it skewed older because also networks skew older. So um, Freeform had had their eye on it the whole time we were developing it. And they were like, NBC will never pick this up. So call us when they don't. <laughs> That's hilarious. Wow. And NBC did not. We called Freeform, and then I completely redeveloped it for them and made it the show it always should have been, which mm. is centered on the women and centered on young women. And at the time, you really couldn't do shows about women in their 20s. Mm. It's so interesting to think about that now. I think having a lot more TV um, outlets, there's a lot more opportunity for niche shows. I guess shows about women are still considered niche but um yeah it was i never could have developed something like that at at the networks very cool Uh, we're just going to take a break to hear from sponsors but then i really want to hear about this experience creating and actually having your show live um (laughs) (laughs) so we'll talk about that in a second okay drivingfootage.com provides 4k nine angle driving plates for film and television Over 14,000 clips are available for locations all around Southern California, with more areas coming soon. A fully equipped camera car with height-adjustable rig is available for custom shoots and second-unit photography. Get more realistic driving shots so your viewer will pay attention to the story. Visit drivingfootage.com for details. AVGearGuy.com provides computer and gear rentals serving the LA area, including laptops with final draft, as low as $9 a day with long booking rates available. They also scan photos, documents, 
video and audio tapes, and film reels to digital so you can easily share with your friends and family. Mention the name of the TV Writer Podcast and you will get 10% off your order. Visit avgearguide.com for details. Full disclosure, I do own both of these companies. By supporting them, you help me bring new in-person video interviews to you. And we're back. Okay, the bold type. The bold type is a is a massive thing for your career. Tell me about just everything from start to developing it, casting it, getting it off the ground. Uh, it was it was really it was tough. Um, it was. It's interesting now that I'm I'm in the middle of doing a network pilot to see how different the cachet is. Um, doing a pilot for Freeform, you've got a lower budget, which means you have lower amounts to pay everyone. Um, it's also not considered as sexy an outlet. So it was a lot. It was hard to get. We weren't really getting our top choices for a lot mm. of things. Um, and we had a really hard time getting a director on board. I had really wanted a female director. Um, we kind of went to bat for somebody who didn't have as many credits. Um, and then she ultimately dropped out at the last minute. And we ended up with a director who I did not get along with at all. Oh. Um, so it was, and I don't mind saying that publicly because there's some fairly awful things have come out about him in the press. Um, but it was just, it was hard. It was, I was trying to make a feminist, a bold feminist pilot with somebody who was not that way. I'll just leave it at that. Um, so everything was a fight. Everything was a disagreement. Everything was me trying to, it's, it's interesting. I'll like, I don't want to go too much into all this, but I will say it was interesting because I feel like even when I was working on shows that were almost entirely men, I never felt less than as a woman. Mm. And I, and looking back now, I don't know if it's just that I was working with great guys. I think that's part of it. Or if it's because I was in more of a, a low level role that they were comfortable with that. But the bold type just felt very different. I wow. felt not supported or, you know, so it was tough. It was a very tough experience. Sorry. So um, thank but, you. But still you got it. Made I got it and, on the air. <laughs> yeah, it got on the air. And, and it's gone three seasons so far? Four. Yeah. Four, four. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Now you weren't you weren't on it for that whole time, but No, no, no. I left after the first season. It like I said, it was it was tough. And also there it just sort of collided with a lot of things in the world. Um we got picked up to series two days after the twenty sixteen election. So, you know, it's interesting because when we were shooting that pilot, I really thought we were going to have our first female president. And instead, Trump got elected. We're in this like incredible surge of misogyny like we've never seen in in politics. I was really dealing with it in my career like I'd never dealt with before. And it was just it's a very it was a soul crushing year. I'm incredibly proud of what I fought for and what I got under the screen, but it was a diff. It was very, very difficult personally and professionally. Yeah, I, I remember um, the conversations before that election, and then it was <laughs> it was. I can't remember people being so affected like that, like coming into work after that. It was like after nine eleven or something. Like people were just yeah, they couldn't even work. I was shell shocked. Yeah. 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 Um, well, so, so that was a tougher experience than you wanted it to be, but I think something, I mean, it would, I be right in saying that your book came out of that experience. A thousand percent. My book came out of that experience because I, I just, after that, I had to step away from TV for a little while. I just needed a break and I needed to, kind of process everything that was happening in our country, everything that was happening in our industry. And I started writing that book. I came up with the idea um, and just to sort of to, for listeners to soft pitch the idea. Mm -hmm. It's the story of four best girlfriends, their senior year of high school. And we know something they don't, which is that one of them is going to grow up to be the president of the United States. Wow. Wow. And it really stemmed from me wanting to write something really hopeful, really optimistic, and really that showed this female empowerment. Um, because at the time, I was feeling so negative about the state of the world 
And my boyfriend was so much more optimistic Mm. and he teaches eighth grade. And so he would be in this classroom of eighth graders all day and then come home and tell me like, you don't have to worry. Like they've got it. Like this generation Uh, has got it. Like, you know, I know it seems so bleak people our age and older, but like they've got it. Mm. And I just started thinking about how things are going to change when like your daughter's generation Mm. gets into power. And I can't freaking wait Mm. (laughs) because I just think they're, that really is the generation that's going to save us. And I was just, I was so inspired by their stories, by the way the Parkland students found their voices. I was, it's interesting because I was originally thinking I might make the book as a a period piece set in the nineties. And then the person would, the woman would be coming the president now. Mm. But then once the Parkland shooting happened, I realized, Oh no, it's this, it's this upcoming generation. Like they're, they're the ones. Mm. And, and so I, you know, I, I felt blessed that like my TV career had given me the ability to take a year off and just write a book. Mm. (laughs) And, um, it, and it was so fun too. It's sort of like the best, the best thing about TV is also can be the worst, which is that it's collaborative. Mm -hmm. And like I said, on the bold type, there were a lot of difficult collaborations. So to have something that was just mine and to be able to write something in empowering and hopeful and very with strong women where I wasn't getting notes from (laughs) (laughs) terrible men I'll just say it was was really wonderful and very like rejuvenating for me personally and professionally oh so cathartic (laughs) so cathartic yeah Yeah. very cool and so um, unfortunately you have this situation where your launch has been been effective but (laughs) yeah it's been (laughs) It's been a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, but but how's it been? How's it been getting it out there and starting to hear feedback from it? It's been really exciting. I it, it's interesting because I felt like my goals were so different for this one because it was so personal and so special to me that my goal was not to be a bestseller or some big famous author. My goal was to write something that would matter to mm. one person. That was my goal, one person. Yeah. And I've already gotten several letters and several really nice comments from people that this book matters to. So I feel like I did it. Whatever happens with the book, wherever it goes, I did it. Well, I, I honestly think that that thing is so important. It's sort, sort of like um, how people thought it was impossible. Like it literally wasn't possible to run a four-minute mile. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Like, like literally, if you asked anybody, they would say, no, it just can't be done. And then one person does it, and now high school students are doing it. Like it, it's it's important to have that 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 switch in your mind that says this is possible. Yeah. This, yeah. And, exactly. and if you can switch that switch on for one, that one person may be the one who grows up to be president. Yeah. Because you, but because you've told them it is possible. It is possible, and that's the thing, and that's why the four um, the four girls who it's about they're very different characters. Oh, and it's a mystery; you don't know which of these four girls is going to become the president. And they're all very they have a lot of strong qualities, but they also have a lot of flaws. Because mm-hmm. I want every little girl to know that she can grow up to be anything she wants to be. I honestly, I think that is such a, pow- a powerful um, vehicle for the book because. You spend the book wondering who's going to yeah. be, and 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 also I can't think of a better way to to empower people from different, you know, who are different to say, well, okay, it wasn't that person from the beginning. It could have been anybody. Yeah, well, it's also about how our friendships really define us. Mm. Um, it's about how these girls shape each other. And I, I, you know, at the time I was just getting really emotional thinking about how I am who I am because of Mm. the friendships I had as a kid and in high school and how my, my female friendships weren't backstabby. We weren't terrible. We pushed each other to be better and to be stronger and to go farther in life. And I think that's how most women's female friendships are. But we always see the backstabby catty versions on TV and in books. Mm. And so I wanted to write something that um, I joke around that it's friendship porn because these are (laughs) friendship. Yeah. Very, very cool. Well, it's all friendship porn. That's my brand. Yeah. Um, Well, I, I, I think kudos to you for, for turning this around into something so hopeful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me more about um, this this pilot. And, and, and I'm sorry, I, I did actually, I, 
as I was tweeting, I I I thought initially when you were talking about Goonies, I something in my mind said, "Oh, it's a it's a reboot." It's yeah, got... everybody, it's a reboot. So everybody like tweeting at me like, "How dare you reboot this?" I'm like, reboot. So as much as you can say, tell me what it is oh, and I not can, what it isn't. Yeah. yeah. So the basic premise of the of it is it's about um, this small blue collar town in Ohio and. Three students there are putting on this very ambitious shot for shot remake of one of the students all time favorite movies, The Goonies. Mm -hmm. And it's really that it's a love letter to the power of cinema storytelling and dreams. It's about how movies define us and save us. And it really pulls in um, a substitute teacher first, who's sort of our main entry point to the show. But really, over the course of the season, God willing, if we ever (laughs) shoot it and get on the air. (laughs) you're going to see how it touches everybody in the town and pulls mm-hmm. everybody in. Um, and uh, to in order to get the movie rights, we're doing this with Amblin Television also. And so I pitched this to Steven Spielberg. Really? Which was, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> wow. Which was amazing. And uh. the pitch went so well. And at the end of it, you know, he just slapped his hand on the table and said, I would watch this. Oh, wow. And, yeah, which I still like that will carry me to the end of the days. Um, but I realized later, oh, my gosh, I basically pitched Steven Spielberg his life story uh-huh. because he was kind of a lonely kid, um, child of divorce, who really found a lot of hope and a lot of inspiration from movies and from making movies. And that's really what this show is. Our entry mm. point is same thing, kind of a kid with like. A lot of a lot of painful things in his life, and really finds this escape in these hopeful movies and this this expression through storytelling. Those are my ho- my favorite ones to watch. I I love anything like I m- the thing that even got me into this industry was. Um, do you remember uh, there was an autobiography on George Lucas called Skywalking? Oh yeah, I never read it, but yeah. Yeah, and I and I read it, and that's what sort of flip that switch of hopefulness it, it yeah. was such a a like you can dream something in your head and you can make it real like it i, I think there's so much of television that becomes a, a business and a repeating mm-hmm. business and stuff but it's it's so cool to see that you can do these these hopeful projects yeah and especially for me personally coming out of this year of writing this book that really was this passionate hopeful thing that really saved me Mm -hmm. i i really identify with the main character this young um, movie maker who just you know even in bleak circumstances desperately clings to hope very very cool well and tell me how you um something we missed is how you got this project because (laughs) you've been on parenthood and then and then your uh bold type and then your your book so yeah. at what point did did this even come on your desk? So it's uh, so it's very interesting because like I said I took a f- like full year off from TV to write my book and to and to just live my life. Um it's interesting because uh, sort of in the beginning of that year before I decided I was going to take a year off, I was on my <laughs> so stupid. I was driving to a meeting that my agent had set and I was like halfway there and I was like I do not want to go on to another TV show right now. I mm. don't. I'm not ready. I, I It's not what I want out of my career at the moment. And I just called my agent or my agent's assistant, I think, and I said, I'm not going to this meeting. Cancel it. Tell them I'm sick. <laughs> I turned around. I drove to Disneyland, <laughs> bought myself a season pass, wow. and then decided I'm taking a year off. I'm going to, to Disneyland whenever the F I want, and I'm writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else is just feeling it. Wow. And and so I was still kind of and then my book ended up selling in a fairly big way. Like it sold multiple offers from different houses. I I had written it on a proposal. So then I kind of bought myself more time because once I sold it off the proposal, I had to write it, all that. So I was still finishing up copy edits and and loose ends on the book and was still in this in this time of saying no to everything. Like mm-hmm. Shonda had her year of yes, I had my year of no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I I really just said no to everything. And part of me did wonder, oh my gosh, are people gonna forget about me? Is nobody are people gonna think, oh, she's washed up, you know, but I also didn't care. 
And I think what happened is it kind of did the opposite because I was say, saying no to everything. I suddenly became a get. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, one of the executives at Fox, this was when um, we first, because of the agency code of conduct stuff, we all had to fire our agents. And so um, about a month into that, one of the Fox executives reached out to me directly. And it's somebody who I really like and said, do you want to just come in and sit down <laughs> casually? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, all right, sure, sure. And then they ended up offering me this blind pilot deal, which even I like hemmed and hawed about. But I was like, I can't, I can't not take that. You know, mm. I'd not been working in TV for a year. So I took it. And then I, because of the kind of writer I am, I kept pitching them these like small town, very small character driven things. And they're like, uh, yeah, no, that is not Fox. <laughs> like, yeah, those are lovely characters. No. And but they said because they were like kind of like, well, we'd never do small town stuff. But then it just so happened that they said, well, why don't you go meet with Gail Berman? Because she has this idea about basically she was saying Friday Night Lights meets a film reenactment. And I was like, you know, I jumped out of my chair. I'm like, I, I want that. Like I yeah. volunteer as tribute. And so I really took all these characters that I had been trying to put into like some vague small town soap and put them into this bigger, splashier idea that gives this really powerful in and this really great story engine. Very, very cool. Very cool. Um, and actually, I do have to ask, um, is there any interest in most likely becoming... Something. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In fact, I'm really, really late on a second draft for Amazon. Um, yeah. Amazon auctioned it. Oh, um, really? Yeah. So I wrote the first draft and then um, have notes I need to do. But then my Fox pilot got picked up. Hmm. So last week, my Amazon exec was like, oh, hey, remember us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I need to. I'm yeah. working on that right now it's, as well. It's a really easy project to pitch. Like yeah. you get that idea so fast. Yeah, completely. Yeah, very cool. Well, uh, unless there's anything else you want to talk about in in that neighborhood, I do want to switch gears to sort of talk about advice to greener writers. Yeah, let's that's switch okay. to greener writers. Okay, <laughs> greener so writers, so greener writers. <laughs> first up, the ubiquitous question: um, Do you like to read specs or pilots? Oh, so that is a very good question. In a perfect world, I would rather read specs because I, I think pilots showcase a very different talent. Like when I'm looking for, for writers on staff, I want people who can be story machines and work within an existing construct and also write to a voice that isn't necessarily theirs. Um, I think setting up a pilot, you're, you're doing so much it's such a different beast than writing an episode of an existing show. However, what makes it really hard is that there's so many shows out there. It It's hard to pick a show to spec because mm. odds are the showrunner won't have been watching it unless you're picking like something that everybody is watching, which right now I guess would just be like love is blind or the tiger, which you can't spec anyways. <laughs> so, um, so in a perfect world, I would love to read specs, but realistically, I read a lot more pilots. Mm -hmm. Will you ever ask for different material when, when somebody submits something? Yes, definitely. Yeah, like if somebody, like I read um, for the bold type, somebody had submitted some, it was a movie, and it was excellent, but it was set in the 1900s, so it was all very period dialogue, and I just, I wanted to see, okay, like clearly they can tell a story, clearly they can make these amazing characters, but can they write? modern language was it was it you that said on a panel I can't, I can't remember now that uh that you even read scripts for assistance oh i don't know if i did say that but i do i like the idea of that because i believe in promoting from within and so i definitely want assistance who i can see promoting someday mm -hmm. yeah I, th I thought that was fascinating i i it was in one i think it might have been a panel that you were in but somebody else said it but uh it really stuck with me that um that uh I, I had never heard that before that that even assistants are are getting read even while they're still assistants yeah which makes me happy too because i think there were there was a mentality for a long time that assistants were just assistants and i see assistants as as writers and as people i want to be able to bring up on staff eventually mm -hmm. um and so what do you look for in the scripts you read 
um, it's it'll sound cliche, but I look for character, humor, and heart. I just mm-hmm. want something that moves me. I want something that makes me laugh. I want something that makes me cry. I don't care the world, whether it's genre, whether it's historical, whether it's modern, big swing ideas, small swing ideas. I just want to connect to the characters and care about them. Mm-hmm. And as you're building a room, are you are you thinking about sort of I'm going to have my character person here, my humor person there, like building people who have have really strong um, skills in one area or or you want to stack it with people who are sort of in line with with what you're you're selling in a dream world i like to have people who are the entire package but i um sometimes that's not always achievable and so yeah like i'll try to find somebody who's an incredible story generator and somebody who's an incredible incredible at humor mm-hmm. in uh in when they when somebody comes in for an interview, um, what would you say are some of the do's and don'ts? I mean, I'm really looking for people who are going to be pleasant in the room and and really keep the room going. Like, I like to run a really efficient room. Like, you know, rooms used to be there till 1, 2 in the morning all the time. And sometimes that's going to happen. But I feel like a lot of times it was just because everybody spends all day just messing around and then by 10 p.m. it's like oh wait we got to do something and no like I like to start the room late so if people are parents they can do morning drop off um go till about four or five so I like people who can be really focused but since we spend that much time in the room like I just (laughs) got to make sure you're not a terrible person Uh uh-huh very cool and and um and sort of what who's whose recommendation will you will you favor in terms of uh, like say, say for instance, Javi really wanted you to, to come for that show. If there's somebody who calls and says, I've got this writer, will you, will you take that recommendation? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Re- recommendations from other writers mean a ton to me. Um, and recommendations from executives are obviously very important. Um, and especially like for younger writers getting onto those network and those studio lists is a huge, huge deal. But the executives have a relationship with writers in a very different way than writers have relationships with writers. So I will say, even though I'm always going to look at those network lists, if I get a personal recommendation from a writer I like and trust, that means the most to me. That makes sense because you're you're with them day in and day out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so oh, I just lost my train of thought there. Um, when when you're running a room, um, what do you think? Are there things that you've picked up along the way that you think really make a good room? Um, I think being respectful makes a really good room. Um, I really learned to run a room from Jason Kadams. He, Mm. no, nobody does it better. Um, He's efficient. He's smart. He knows exactly what he wants. Um, And that's huge too, because a lot of times when you end up churning your wheels, and going down wrong roads is because the showrunner doesn't know what they want. And so I've learned that it's really important to be decisive. Um, and it's also really important as a showrunner to be in the room as much as you can. That's the other thing that Jason taught me that I found so important because on other shows, there'd be times when we wouldn't see the showrunner for a week. They'd be in post, they'd be on set, they're not checking in. I mean, the showrunning job is all consuming so i get it believe me but jason always made the room a priority and he would always come in in the morning and give us an objective what he wanted us to accomplish that day and he would almost always come in in the evening so we could check in so we were never going in the wrong direction Mm -hmm. for very long and that it was and that was a level of respect to us that that meant a lot because a lot of times when showrunners go MIA for a week you spend a week writing a story and falling in love with it and the showrunner comes in and blows it up in five minutes and it just Mm. it feels disrespectful it's hard for it not to feel that way um even though it's really not you can't take it personally but it just it becomes a little demoralizing and exhausting and then you have to go back to square one and maybe that happens again Whereas Jason, if he knew there was a couple days in a row where he couldn't be in the room, he would just cancel the room. He would have everybody go home and be with their loved ones, (laughs) get stories that way. And it just, it was a very respectful experience and process and a really efficient experience and process. Wow. Wow. Um, 
that that seems like it, it would be great if all rooms were like that. <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, we've gone from 212 shows in 2010 to there were like 532 last year. Oh my so god! Two and a half times as many shows, but that also means that that there's two and a half times many showrunners needed. Yeah. So you have a lot of yeah. showrunners that are not maybe as experienced. Totally, totally. I feel very grateful that I rose the ranks and that I did it slowly and I learned as I went because a lot of people are kind of catapulting into these positions and mm. then some rise to the challenge, but some, how could you possibly know mm. if you've only been a staff writer or you've never sold anything before? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm very happy for things like the showrunners training program and yeah. uh, things like that that are helping people to sort of even even if they are coming at it fairly green as a as as a showrunner that they can get that that help. Um, but uh, I want to talk a little bit, bit about mentoring. Is mentoring important mm -hmm. to you? Hugely important because I feel really lucky that I was mentored, um, and it really, I see it as an organic thing. Like when it, it's, it almost like never works out when you're like, you get, sometimes it does. Like if you get buddied up with somebody and you get paired up with, but like the mentoring situations I, I had, like Javi has really become a mentor to me mm -hmm. because we found that we had voices that matched each other really well. And so he would really take the time to explain things to me and to give me challenges bigger than I felt I was ready for. And mm -hmm. it was a, like a very natural mentorship. And I try to do that on staffs as well. Um, I especially try to, you know, I empowering young women is something mm -hmm. that's important to me. So on staffs, I try to find the young women with promise and yeah. <laughs> tell good. them all I, my grizzled wisdom. <laughs> of course, as a dad of a young daughter who, well, not so young now, who's yeah. going to be entering in this industry. I'm very happy that there's people like you out there. And there are so many more than not. Mm -hmm. There was this, like I said, there was this period of time when there were a lot, oftentimes no women in rooms or one woman in the room. And during that time, I feel like women weren't helping each other out because when there's only room for one woman in the room, you're like, well, it has to be me. So I'm not right. going to help somebody else in. And it's not like that at all anymore. And I find women do really go out of their way to help each other. Very, very cool. Um, so would you have any general advice to greener writers, people who are coming up right now, um, things that, uh, it's like you wish you had done or, or you see perhaps, um, younger writers making the same mistakes. Um, what are some things that you, that you could say that would help them to, to avoid some pitfalls? Yeah, I think the most important thing is to be writing constantly, because I, the, the biggest mistake I see from younger writers is they write one pilot and they're like, okay, I got my pilot. I'm ready. Hmm. Well, maybe, but like you are going to get better with everything you write. And you're also going to have more samples that are more appropriate for different shows with everything that you write. And so keep writing, keep writing, rewrite something and then rewrite it again and then write something new because you only get one first shot on staff and you want to be as ready as possible. And so the more writing you've done and you have under your belt, you'll, you'll be a lot more prepared when you've, because the most frustrating thing for me about this business is there really is no one way in. Mm. And so you might get really lucky and get staffed right away. It might take five years of toil and struggle. You never know when you're going to get in. So just be as ready as possible when you get that shot. Very cool. Well, that actually is a great place to end up. Um, and uh, I really, really appreciate you taking your time. And I, I, I just wish you the best of luck with it, with both of these projects. Uh, well, thank you. So I guess much. you could call it three because the developing three, the yeah. bold, uh, developing the uh, most likely project is kind most of likely, a yeah. is is a third one. Um, I uh, I pray that this virus will yes. go its merry way and let us get back to work very soon. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This was yeah, a lot of you're fun. You're welcome, and happy birthday again. Thank you. Take care. Well, thanks for joining me. And remember to follow me on Twitter at Gray Jones is my handle to find out about what interviews are coming. Make sure to send your questions in and please do be sure to subscribe on iTunes, 
Podbean, Spotify. Make sure that you post reviews and comments. Contact me and send your questions on Twitter. I'd be happy to hear from you and watch for these episodes weekly during our stay-at-home order. Anyway, thanks for joining. Bye-bye.